everybody, uh, my name is Dana Matnock and I am going to be the doing the teaching today for us for week eight. Um, and we cannot believe that it's week eight. Um, how did we get here? Eight weeks have passed and we have just dug into Deuteronomy and we hope that you have enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed preparing and studying and teaching. Um, we just want to remind you that just because we have finished up and we're wrapping up these eight weeks that you do not have to be done studying Deuteronomy here. You can continue to dive in, um, digging deeper into your study. Deuteronomy will always be available to you. So if you have your book and you have a friend, you can continue to dig deeper. Um, and if you have questions, you're always we are always available for you to reach out. Um, if you are studying and you just have, you'd like more insight or anything like that. So before we start, we're just going to take a moment to quiet our hearts uh, with this worship song. Okay friends, here we are at the end of Deuteronomy. I can't believe it, but let's dive in. So we're at the De end of Deuteronomy and the Israelites are about to enter the promised land. Um, unfortunately, we know that Moses does not get to go in. So we're gonna do a little bit of a refresher here as to why. So if you'll turn to Numbers 20 with me, uh, we are gonna look at verses six to 13, just for a little refresher there. It says, then Moses and Aaron went up from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, 
uh, will tell a rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Okay, so then <laughs> moving on, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them, Hear, you, hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with the staff twice, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their livestock. But Moses, or the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. So there we have it. Moses' directions were to tell the rock, okay, talk to the rock, speak to the rock. Instead, Moses got a little sassy, and he struck the rock, okay? So the Lord lays it out for him that you will not be entering into the promised land with the Israelites. Um, so because Moses was not going to be entering, he spends his last years of his life giving directions and sermons to the Israelites to kind of mentor them through what was going to be happening. Uh, Deuteronomy is essentially an, a recording of those sermons and directions as we've seen so far. So if you think about it, it was really necessary for Moses to continue to repeat himself over and over with all of this because the Israelites didn't have a book that they were holding on to that they could look back and be like, oh, what did the Lord say about that? Um, everything needed to be said. Um, and this next generation really needed those reminders. So uh, fortunately for, for them, Moses had a very close relationship with the Lord, a very intimate relationship with him, and he spent intimate time in his presence um, in Deuteronomy as a result of that. Uh, Moses had true joy and peace because of that relationship that he had with God, and even though he wasn't getting to go into the land and getting that part, he was at peace with the relationship with part, so with the relationship part. So he was really trying to walk the Israelites through that relationship, into a relationship with the Lord, and essentially up into the land. Um, so we see here, um, you're going to see on your sheet, it says at the top, Moses disobeyed, right? And because of that, God told him that he would not enter the promised land. But we have a next part of the story here. Moses' successor was appointed by God to lead the Israelites into the land, and that was Joshua. Okay, Joshua was Moses' successor. So Joshua was not going to get the same opportunities as Moses to be face-to-face -face with God. Um, in Deuteronomy 34.10, it says that Moses was the last prophet to see him face-to-face. -face. So you could imagine taking Moses' place. Uh, your mentor is about to die. Uh, one that has been in the presence of God, had this intimate relationship with him, and now he needs to take over, um, but he will not have that face-to-face -face experience with the Lord. Um, so Moses is going to give him a little bit of a pep talk, going to give jo Joshua a little bit of a pep talk before he um, needs to take over uh, in leadership, his leadership role. So if you will turn to Deuteronomy 31 with me, we're going to start reading verses 1 to 8 there. So it says, Joshua to succeed Moses, chapter 31. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go before you, and he will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and the Og and the kings of the Amorites and their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you, and he will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So these words from Moses were truly a declaration of hope for Joshua to press forward when he was feeling doubt and discouragement and when he just an encouragement that he would never be alone. And honestly, these words are priceless for us too as we face uncertainty in our circumstances and we sometimes we feel ill-equipped in our callings. These are truly a declaration for hope of hope for us as well. 
And honestly, it was probably terrifying for the Israelites. Moses was the only leader they had ever known. So you could imagine just with all of their um, lack of faith and lack of obedience and their track record with rebelling that Moses could see that anytime they had felt fear, they would rebel. So he's just sort of laying it out on the line here that I'm going to die and Joshua is going to take over. There aren't going to be any surprises. Um, So now we're going to see how this continues to play out because Joshua is, the plan is for him to lead them the rest of the way. So if you look in Deuteronomy 31, we're going to start up now at 14. Um, And this is when Joshua is commissioned, okay? So now the Lord said to Moses, Behold the day's approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that I may commission him. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. And the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood over the entire entrance of the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering, and they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. And I'm just going to skip forward to 23 real quick, real quick where the Lord says to Joshua, the Lord commissions Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, be strong and courageous for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them and I will be with you. I just think there's such significance in the fact that the Lord appears like his presence is there with Moses and Joshua as they gather all of the Israelites and Moses is commissioning him. But it's not just like, hey guys, I found this guy off the streets and he's who I pick to be next, to, to take over. And the Israelites would have been like, yeah, right, um, you're going to leave us hanging like that. Um, no, the Lord is there and God is saying in front of the people, Joshua, I will be with you. Be strong and courageous. Moses is saying, be strong and courageous. The Lord is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And God's presence is there. And I just think Joshua, he really needs this encouragement. Could you imagine he's taking over for these whining, complaining, just rebellious Israelites. And he has to take over in Moses' spot, you know, and just kind of follow in the footsteps of this mentor that he's had. And I just imagine him to be so nervous. And I just think that these words were just so significant for him. And honestly, the Israelites were so distracted by shiny things. I feel like if there would have been, if the Lord had not been a part of that commissioning, uh, they would have just been so apt to just follow whoever, the next shiny thing, the next thing that could give them the fulfillment that they were looking for, the answers that they, to the questions they had. Um, They were just so easily distracted. And I feel like truly that's how we are today. We are so, we, we don't want harsh realities or harsh truths and instead of truly looking in God's word and listening for God's word it can be so easy to go see what that next author or that next pastor or that next um, social person on social media has to say um, and instead of really truly being uh, in God's word and pursuing his words we tend to get caught up in other people's words about his words and that can be a really slippery slope. And I just think it's truly, truly important that we be able to recognize truth, especially in the season and time in our world that we are in. Um, I saw a quote that said, we must read God's word if we want to recognize God's voice. Um, And Moses is just reminding them, the Israelites, of God's nearness to them. He is here. He's available to us. We have his word written down for us. So we should, we need to be in that word so that we are able to identify the false prophets and those little tidbits of progressive Christianity that get slid in here and there. Um, Because even Moses says, he's warning the Israelites in Deuteronomy 30, if your heart turns away, you know, from God's words, you won't hear and you will turn to other gods and serve them. And we have that same, that warning goes for us as well. Um, We really need to know how to test other people's words against the truth. Um, And there's just so much in life I think that we want relief from right now, the same as the Israelites. And he's saying the only true relief and the only hope that you have is in nearness to God, in nearness to his words. Um, But another thought I had was, I wondered if Moses like ever got sassy or like had a lapse of judgment and was like, seriously, Lord, you're not going to let me in? Like, is that a real thing? We're actually, I'm not going in? Um, Like, do you think that Punishment really fits the crime. Uh, So I look back, actually, Deuteronomy 3, because he's human after all, right? 
he, he might have been the last prophet to see him as face to face and be intimate with him, but that doesn't mean that we don't have uh, sin in our flesh. So uh, it says in Deuteronomy 3.23, and I, Moses is speaking, and I pleaded with the Lord at the time saying, oh Lord, you have begun to show your servant, your greatness and your mighty hand for what God is there in heaven or earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours. Kind of like pepping him up a little bit. And then he says, he starts begging to go in. Please let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country in Lebanon. But the Lord was angry with me because of you. He's kind of blaming the Israelites. It's your fault. And you would not listen to me. And the Lord said, enough from you. Do not speak to me of this matter again. Whoo! I don't want to, I'm, I'm sure there's a few times the Lord's been saying that to me <laughs> from up there. So Moses had to realize that this is what was going to happen. God's plan all along for him was that he would be passing the baton to Joshua. God knew that Moses would disobey. He knew that Joshua would be the one that was leading them into the Jordan and finishing, the, or into the promised land over the Jordan to finish the job. And that doesn't mean that Moses' role wasn't important, though. Uh, there was a clear priority in his teaching and his time with the Israelites. Um, and just because he couldn't go in, he had the opportunity to truly educate them. Um, and honestly, the, the harsh reality of this is that Moses wasn't essential to that part of God's plan, and neither are we. And at least not in the way that we think we are. And that can be really a tough pill to swallow sometimes because I think we really think that we know, we think we know, what jobs were, were made for. Like, Lord, I'd be really good at that. Don't you want to use me there? Uh, and that's certainly not the case. Uh, I think Moses was probably thinking at some points, like, you think they can really make it without me? And the Lord's saying, yep, yep, they can because they have me. So Moses had to humble himself really and realize that because of what he w had done, his days were fleeting. And we really need to recognize our need to be humble. Uh, in Psalm 39.4, uh, we can make that into a prayer. It says, Oh Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. And Moses really did realize how fleeting he was in his ministry and that, you know, it was going to eventually come to an end and he needed to be content with that. But contentment is hard. We all know that. Uh, it would be a lot easier, I think. Well, I say that, who knows. But if we kind of had it in black and white the way Moses did, Moses had his plan sort of cut and dry revealed in scripture. And that is not the case for us. We, Moses knew that, you know, he was not entering, he was leading the Israelites, he was going to educate them, but then he was going to die. And, you know, he was going to be able to commune in peace with the Lord. And ultimately we know that if we trust in the Lord and we have him in our heart and we are following after him, that we will commune with him in peace again one day as well. But it's the before part that isn't as black and white for us. And that is the part that I have struggled with because I really like control and I really like to know what's next and I like to know step by step and truly my life is the last 33 years that's my life have been the ultimate just display of God's faithfulness and also that I am not in control and that he knows better than I do about six years ago we joke I decided to make my life first um Proverbs 19:21. many are the plans in the mind of man but it is the Lord's purpose that will, pre will prevail Amen. <laughs> um, it's, it's a joke, but it's not a joke because it truly is like a thank you, Lord moment. I think some people would say, unfortunately, but I say, thank you, Lord. That is your purpose that will prevail. Um, I have a tiny situation I'll share. It's like a long story, but I'll make it super short where we just actually moved here a year and a half ago um, from my husband's job. And where we lived before this, we only lived for two years. And Prior to that, we were uh, in residency, my husband's residency. So we, we've moved a few times over the last, um, since we've been married, the last like eight years. So um, I, I moved to that last place we lived kicking and screaming. I did not want to move there. I thought there was nothing for me there. And then after the two years, I had really developed an amazing community. And it was a really small town. And there was just so much good from it. But then um, God called us to move again. And while I was there, I actually had the opportunity to um, kind of start a ministry that the Lord had planted a seed in my heart about back in like 2013, 2014. And it was like coming to fruition and I was taking these steps and I was feeling so fulfilled. I was running this ministry out of my home and, you know, there were just women pouring into my living room that were being fed God's word and people I didn't even know. Like it was just the most amazing thing, that, a beautiful display of God's faithfulness. Um, if you want to meet for coffee, I can give you the whole story because it's really good. But um, 
my husband then, after this had been going on for a, a little while, said, I think actually I'm not thrilled with my job and I'm going to pr pursue a job in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I was just like, you have to be kidding me. Like, I, I actually do like it here. Please don't make me go. And um, in the end result, obviously, we did move. Um, and I had to pass the baton on two friends of mine that were helping me there with this ministry that they would be able to make it whatever, you know, I had to put my trust in God that his plan and, you know, we had peace that passed understanding that this was the right thing that he was calling us to, but it was painful and I did not like it and I was not thrilled. Um, but I passed the baton to my friends who were there and wanted to keep it going and it was kind of like in their hands now. If they wanted to keep it going or if they didn't, it was up to them. But it was a really hard time and I think that's a lot of times what God's plans for us look like and that can be frustrating because we don't want, um, our flesh doesn't want pain or suffering in what we think God's plan is for us. We want instant gratification. We want joy. We think that if we're being nudged by the Holy Spirit and we act accordingly, like I did by starting this ministry, that um, everything should succeed. And it sh I was like, I had like long-term visions. I was like, this thing is going to be like a long-term thing for me and watch it grow, blah, blah, blah. And turned out it wasn't about me at all. And God plucked me right out of it and um, had a completely different plan. So... I just think that it's really important to remember, to remind ourselves that God can really use us in whatever way he sees fit, not what way we see fit, um, and that his plans are far bigger than ours. And, you know, it was funny because before, not funny, but I can look back now and say it's funny. Before we moved, multiple people spoke the words abundance over our family. And later on, I had been studying and I was in my Bible and I was studying Psalm 66 and it says that God has brought us through the fire and water, and into a place of abundance. I'm paraphrasing, but go to Psalm 66 and see for yourself. But I just, um, one of those people that spoke those words over us also mentioned a breaking in the process, and I was just like, what do you mean a breaking? Like, I'm already so upset. Like, what do you mean it's going to be hard? Like, is, abundance is good. I'm going to move there, and it's going to be great. What do you mean a breaking? And um, sure enough, it was not easy. <laughs> the beginning of our time here was not easy and half of it has been COVID. So whatever you want to think about that, but, um, it has definitely been a journey. And the most important part of that though, is our response to God's love should be obedience and God loves us and he is faithful to us and he, we can trust in him. And so we obey him. But the most important part of that also is on the other side of that obedience, even if we have to walk through the fire, even after we, if we have to walk through the water, there is abundance on the other side. And the thing, us as Christians, we're restless. We're like, God, use me, use me. I'm here. I'm available. But not then it comes down to it, and he's like calling out to us. And you're like, oh, that nudge about children's ministry, like, I don't know if I really like kids. Or like, you know, but I'll wait for another sign to see if I should sign up for that. And it just goes on and on and on. And we think that there's like a mold that we fit into. And a lot of times God's going to use us and it's going to be outside of the mold that we think that we fit into. And we have to consider it an honor and privilege to do anything for the Lord that he asks us of us, big or small. And at any moment, like we need to hold those plans loosely in the palm of our hand, our plans, God's plans, because at any moment he could ask us to pass the baton and we will have to lean in in another area of our lives. And we have to be content with that. So like, yeah, that's what the next part of my, my notes say. We have to be content with whatever role God has for us. Um, and the peace follows, honestly. The peace, when you are obeying, that peace that passes understanding will pour over you. And that's what Moses felt. He had peace and Joshua had peace. They knew that they were doing what was right and obeying um, what God had called them to. And it wasn't maybe pretty at all times. And of course, they were leading the Israelites, which would be like leading a group of us. And we whine and we complain and we turn to the right and the left and we aren't looking straight, um, you know, at God's words all the time. But he is always there and available to us. So, okay, I'm going to wrap up a little bit here. Moses has done everything that God has told him to do and he's standing on top of the mountain and in Deuteronomy 34, it explains his exact location of where he's standing. But God says, okay, you've seen it. He's, Moses is looking out over the promised land. You've seen it with your eyes, but you're not going in. So at 120 years old, Moses dies. And I thought it was really interesting because uh, 
there in that scripture, it says that his eyes were undimmed and his vigor unabated, which means he could still see fine. His strength was still there. Um, Just because he was old, he wasn't like decrepit and, but it didn't matter. Like his time was done and the Lord was calling Joshua. Um, So no one actually knows. This was actually a really interesting part too. No one actually knows where Moses is buried. God buried him down in the valley of the mountain that he was looking over because God did not want the Israelites to be able to make an idol out of his grave. You know, they got so irritated at Moses and now all of a sudden he's dying and they're like, you know, oh, we don't want Joshua, we want Moses. And he he was like, okay, so now when I put Moses in charge, is he going to be the, like, I don't know, are they going to, when I put Joshua in charge, start rebelling and then they'll go worship Moses' grave? Like, Moses, we miss you, please come back. So he just eliminated that completely and um, Moses was buried um, down in the valley by God. But now it's go time for Joshua. And because of God's words, we know that Joshua was not alone. Um, God had commissioned him and he was not going to abandon him now. And that's the same for us. God will truly never abandon you when he commissions you. He is with you. He is for you. And when you are obeying and in line with his will for your life, he will be closer to you than ever before. And, um, you know, it's just, we've seen his faithfulness play out in our lives over and over again. And that's truly what this, the book of Deuteronomy is. It's a story of God's faithfulness and what it looks like when we obey him. So I just wanted to give you this important reminder that God will go before you. He will never leave you alone in your circumstances, and he is in control. We must be content in whatever role he has for us because we know that in that role, he will be using us for his glory, Um, and that is ultimately um, what he wants from us. So um, that's pretty much all I have for you, and that's a wrap-up of Deuteronomy. Uh, I can't believe that we're finishing it up, but... If you would like to read more, like we said, please feel free to keep digging in um, and studying more of what Moses had to teach the Israelites. There's always more that you can pull out. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then and we'll be wrapped up. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much uh, that you are with us always. Thank you that you never leave us. Thank you that you will never forsake us. Um, thank you that we have your war- words that we can look back on and reflect on, and that Uh, that just that we can rest in the fact that you are always in control. Thank you for your faithfulness and your holiness and your sovereignty, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would be just in tune to the Holy Spirit and how we are being, what are we, we are being nudged towards, what ways you want to use us and that we would be inclined to obey, Lord. I pray that we would be so um, in line with what your word says, Lord, and in tune to your word that we would be able to test other people's words in our world against that and be able to know the truth. Lord, we want to know you better. We want to know you more and we want to study the Bible to learn all we can about you, Lord. We thank you so much that we've been able to meet and we've been able to bring this study to completion. I pray that you would bless these home groups and the people studying online and the people studying um, with one other person, just everybody, who, all these women who were able to connect with this study. I just thank you so much that we were given this opportunity, Lord. I pray that you would bless us as we wrap up our time together um, and that you would meet us together again soon. In your name we pray. Amen.